This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, everyone. This is Joey Romero. Before we get to Bruce, I wanted to jump in and make a quick announcement. I Survive Real Estate has been scheduled for two fun-filled virtual nights, October 30th and November 6th. Expect more details coming this week. And that leads us to what we're doing on the radio show. We are launching our legacy series. We're leading up to the I Survive Real Estate. We will be interviewing our past Roni Award winners. The Roni is the award we hand out at I Survive Real Estate to an educator or a real estate mentor that has impacted many with their career or their teachings. This is the first of our interviews. Hope you enjoy. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest is John Schaub. The Roni Award, by the way, was created uh, because a man named Jim Rohn changed my life in three hours one night in 1980 and sent it in a completely different direction. John received the Roni Award to recognize his contribution to the real estate investment business and the many lives who have been changed because he took the time to teach what he knew. John has prospered during three recessions, four tax law changes, and interest rates ranging, it says here, from 6 to 16, and I guess we've got to amend that, in his, 35, yeah. <laughs> in his 35 years as a real estate investor, his 2005 best-selling book, Building One, a Wealth One House at a Time, assisted more than 100,000 real estate enthusiasts on their way to successful investing. His 2007 book, Building Wealth in a Changing Real Estate Market, is also available. John, welcome to our show. Thank you, Bruce. It's great to be with you. You know, I really was lucky that uh, Jim Rohn and I crossed paths in 1980. Did you have anybody in your life that you would say was uh, was kind of a life-altering experience as a teacher? Yes, a fellow by the name of Warren Harding. And I don't know if you ever met Warren, but uh, he was from my town. He was from Sarasota. And he has an interesting name, and he was a very interesting fellow. But he was very encouraging to me uh, to, to start speaking and writing. And uh, I don't think I would have done that without, you know, without his influence. And he also exposed me to uh, some creative real estate ideas, which were new to me. You know, I was a real <laughs> estate broker at the time and young man and had 13 salesmen and was doing just a traditional list and sell operation. And uh, he opened my eyes to a whole new world. Uh, and uh, so I, I gave him a lot of credit. I didn't realize you had a, a early real estate career as a as a broker. So you owned a brokerage with real estate agents. Yeah, I had 13 salesmen at one time. I, I ran out of college. When I was in college, I, I got my salesman's license. And then I listed a property and I sold it up in Gainesville, Florida, where I was going to school. Made a made a nice commission, about $5,000 back in 1969 or 70. So that was good money back then. Yeah. Uh, and when I, when I got out of school, I, I went, went forward, got my broker's license and started an office and, and uh, didn't do that for very long. I, I didn't like the business, to be honest with you. I, I didn't like babysitting 13 salesmen and, and putting out fires every day. I, I was more of a, a capitalist. I wanted to build capital. And uh, so after a while, I just shut that operation down and, and, and you know, bought I had By then, I'd bought some, a number of properties and we just continued to buy. When you were growing up, I'm not you know, as a kid, did you have an entrepreneurial bent to you at all? Well, I was a paper boy. You know, okay. that's, that's pretty entrepreneurial. <laughs> I had to go and knock on somebody's doors and sell them a paper, then collect the money and try not to throw the paper in a uh, sprinkler every day. Uh, so that, that was probably my first uh, entree into the business world. But then, you know, I did odd jobs as a kid and, and I worked all the way through uh, college. I always liked to work. You know, I always had this, uh, it's probably genetic, I guess, but I like working. And it's funny because I've got a one and a half year old granddaughter living with me right now, along with two of her brothers. And she likes to work, you know, she wants to help unload a dishwasher. <laughs> she wants to help fold the laundry. And, you know, that's one and a half. So I don't know if it's genetic or it's just human nature, but, uh, uh you know, if you like to work, that's a big advantage. <laughs> it, it is a big advantage. Uh, what was the age you owned your first home to live in? Uh, I bought a duplex right out of college. It was probably 1971 or 72, and I bought it with a friend of mine. He lived upstairs, and I lived downstairs, so we kind of split it up. And then the first house I bought as an investment was 1973, and I still have that. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of slow. I don't sell very fast. You know, I buy things and hold them for a very long time, and uh, and that's probably been the secret of my success is, is not, not being too fast. Were you ever tempted by the flipping world? 
I've never been good at it. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I've tried a couple of times uh, because, you know, you get tempted, you see all this money being made and, and right at the top of the last uh, market back in about 2007, I bought a house for 260 and we had it sold for 330 and then that fell apart and we had it sold for 290 and that fell apart and I ended up selling for 145. <laughs> so, <laughs> I decided I better not do that again. I'm, I'm not very good at that. And, you know, my, my business is, is really provide, providing affordable rentals for people here in town. That's kind of our, our business model. Yeah. And, and we do that by making good deals going in. We either buy below the market or buy on good terms so we can afford to rent below the market. And then we, we get good tenants and they stay with us. We, we've had people with us literally 30 years and a bunch of people been with us 10 or 20 years. So Yeah, that's, um, it that's works a, pretty well. That's a crazy track record. Now, I'm just curious. Why did you choose real estate as an investment vehicle as opposed to other things, stocks or bonds or, or whatever? Well, because I didn't have much money and I, and I had a couple friends. I actually interviewed for a job uh, with, with a guy in New York who was a friend of my uncle's. My, my uncle was an engineer in New York City. And uh, this fellow talked to me for about 10 or 15 minutes. He said, you know, you, you, you're better suited for real estate. And I don't know why he thought that, but this guy was a really successful stock guy. And then I had some other friends who were in the stock business and they could consistently make about 20% a year. Well, I had $2,000. So I looked 20% of 2000, that's $400 <laughs> a year. I can't eat off of that. I, I need something that goes faster, you know, <laughs> and with real estate, of course, we, we get a lot more leverage than you can use in the stock market. Although I traded commodity options for two years and uh, you know, that's, that's high leverage stuff. And my, my bad news with that was I got way ahead. And then the broker who had my money went bankrupt and I never got my money back. So wow. I, I lost well over a hundred thousand bucks on that venture. And that was back in the early seventies. So, you know, I've, I've, I've tried a couple things, but uh, real estate has just uh, been, been more profitable and uh, just suits me better. So it's not for everybody, but it cer certainly suits me better. I think that's actually important to know about yourself. I got into some day trading. It was crazy successful for the first 45 days. I turned 250 grand into 800 grand. You know, uh, the teacher in me started actually outlining a penny stock course, believe it or not. I never got to finish that course because my 800 turned into 100 grand and I, I became the biggest don't wanter you ever saw in your life. But I learned something about myself. I, the reason I like real estate is I don't have to know the value of it every minute of the day. So honestly, like if I own a stock, not, and it doesn't have to matter to me financially at all, I'm tempted to look at what it's worth. And I, sure. I'm really, I'm really glad I don't have to worry about that. There's no ticker on my properties going, your property just went down or up because both of them drove me nuts actually. So you're right. You match, you match your strategy <laughs> to your personality. When you held rentals, um, what was your first big goal, man? I want to, I want to attain this one. Well, I wanted a hundred thousand dollars in capital. I, I knew once I had a hundred thousand dollars, you know, I could work that hundred thousand dollars and make plenty of money off of it for the rest of my life. Now this is back in the seventies. So, you know, the numbers have changed a little bit since then, but people should set goals that are fairly reasonable. You know, if you set a goal of having a billion dollars or a hundred million dollars, that's just so far remote to most people that the chances of you doing something that'll get you there are pretty slim. And, and I don't think what Bill's guys like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett even set goals like that. I think they set short-term goals and they achieve them and they get better at what they do. And, and then it just kind of builds. Uh, and you know, so, you know, my, my first goal was, was a hundred thousand. Then I set a goal of a million dollars and you just keep working up the line. But really I, changed how I looked at things after a while and set goals in terms of free and clear properties and how many free and clear properties in my town I wanted to own. And when I got to that point, you know, I, it's not that I quit working, but I did shift, shift gears. Uh, and this is, that was, I, I hit that goal back in the eighties. And then I started doing a lot of nonprofit work and I started writing more and, you know, I said, it set my mind to, to helping others more than making more money for myself. Thank goodness you did. That's a, that's a very big influence. You've got a class in October. I'm going to make every effort to attend. So I'm looking forward to that. Owning enough properties to live on, was that something that it hit you one day that you had, you had achieved that? And you were just like, I got that under my belt. 
Well, you know, it, it's really kind of, what am I going to do next? Okay. <laughs> because uh, I guess it depends on what point of your life that you, you reach that. But it, certainly it's a satisfying thing to know that you have enough rental income coming each month that if something happened to me, it would make a whole bunch of difference now because tenants would continue to pay their rents. My family would be fine. But uh, you know, it's not like, you, okay, I'm done. Let's, let's, uh, let's just watch TV the rest of our lives. <laughs> And, and this happens with everybody who retires kind of early, I think. He said, now what are you going to do? You know, I've, I've got friends who have retired even at 70. I said, now what are you going to do? You know, that, that used to be old. It's not old anymore. And uh, so, you know, you just don't quit doing things because if you do just quit doing things and, and quit doing things that are meaningful for de- to you and, and stimulating, uh, then then you go downhill pretty fast. And, and it's a shame to watch people who have terrific, uh, you know, minds and a lot of skills just quit and uh, just slide off the edge. You know, you never see them again or never hear from them again. Yeah, that's a good point. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a, I, one of my good friends who was a, a, another fellow who influenced me greatly, a guy named Millard Fuller. Millard started a group called Habitat for Humanity years ago, and I worked with them for over 20 years. And, and Millard says, nowhere in the Bible does it that mention retirement. <laughs> 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 I think he's got a good point. You know, but retiring is, is not something you have to do. You switch gears. You know, you you certainly don't have to work 80 hours a week all your life. But once you figure it out, uh, you know, the most successful people, I think, work a few hours a week. But they they, what they do is make really good decisions during those few hours. And and they talk to people and and help them along. And, and, uh, you know, you make a lot of progress in a few hours a week if you know what you're doing. John, can I ask you a question? You know, you, Bruce, Peter, you you guys aren't, no offense, but you guys aren't spring chickens. Um, Who who do you see? I'm I'm offended. (laughs) Who who do you see? Who is this talking? This is this is Joey. (laughs) Yeah, get get his name straight. How old are you, Joey? I'm 46. Oh, you're a punk. (laughs) So, who do you see that's up and coming, or who who's from the next generation of real estate teachers that that you're like, hey, this guy's legit? Uh, you know, Brandon Turner, who's got uh, was a bigger pocket. Bigger pockets, uh, yes. yeah, I, I see. I see him as a guy. I mean, he seems to be legit. I, I don't know them. Don't know him personally, but I've talked to him on the phone. And everything seems to be a real guy. Uh, there, there's got to be a lot of legitimate people. You have to be careful of people teaching because most people teaching are just doing it for the money. You know, they're they're if they don't teach, they don't eat. So you're looking for somebody who doesn't teach for a living. It, that uh, yeah. So nobody that, like know. that's on your radar that you're like, okay, I, I've met this guy and he, he's he's one of the well, guys. Well, Gary, you got him, Gary Johnson. I don't know if you know Gary. Sure. Uh, Gary Johnston and Clyde Wilson. Gary is from uh, Boise, Idaho, mm-hmm. and he's your age or a little bit older, but uh, he, he's very sharp. Uh, he was IT guy and took our class and got in the business maybe 15 years ago. Yeah, yes. yeah real good guy. Um, and you have to scratch your head or, I, you know, I'm, I'm really not on the circuit where I'm meeting. I don't go to conventions very often where I meet a whole bunch of people. Sure. But, you know, Mike can't do for sure. Uh, you know, but he, he's in, no Mike's, spring chicken you know, either. <laughs> yeah. it's Bruce throwing shade over here. <laughs> That's funny. You know what? You can't do that. Yeah. You know, what's funny about that is I, I would have a hard time answering that question, Joey. Yeah. Cause that's, he, John's right. There's, it's really rare that you have a very successful investor teach. Uh, they, they, they can be successful investors. That's all they do. By and large, teaching is a business to itself. And that's uh, people that get really good. So when you listen to John speak, there's no effort to run to the back of the room and go buy something. He doesn't need that. And, and it's not, you know, it sells because it's, it's valuable. And I'm very similar. I don't like Run people in the back I know room. we know. I know you know that. <laughs> but there's, it's an art form in a sense that it's, there's an effective process. But it doesn't mean the material's any good. It doesn't even mean they flipped houses. Yeah, I love to teach. I, I you know, it's, uh, it's sort of showbiz, but, but a whole different way. But when you're in front of a, a, an audience. Uh, especially if people who, who want to learn and, and you know, they want to learn, uh, somebody told me years ago, you don't have to motivate us, John, we paid money to come. We want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my speeches are not motivational as much as they are educating people on the right way to, to invest safely and borrow wisely and, and the, the type of properties to buy and how to treat your tenants and how to deal with people and how to, how to treat people. And, and, uh, and you know, all that you're really good at all of that. Uh, but once you develop those skills and have the right attitude, uh, then, you know, life is good. Life is good. Business is good. Yeah. Well, I, I love teaching. That's uh, definitely a passion. Have you always 
invested in your home state or have you gone out of the state in out of Florida? No, I own property in 10 states at one time. Uh, my friend Warren Harding was uh, an exchange counselor and he encouraged people to buy stuff in different places and actually gave them an award. If you own property in 10 states, you had a million dollar net worth. And uh, I have that plaque right here on my wall. I can show it to you. <laughs> Fairly expensive plaque. <laughs> <Because, laughs> property in ten states just because you're shooting for that number doesn't always make you money. And, and I didn't make money on all those. I did make money on some of them, right. and I ended up with some really good partners. Uh, uh, that's the way Peter Fortunato and I got really well associated. Is, is I bought property in his state, and he managed it for me. And and other guys around the country, I had property in Denver and, and, and Tahoe, and you know some fun places. Um, but you know, I, 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 I live in a good town. I live in a good real estate town. And, uh, so if you live in a good real estate town, a town that's growing in population, you, you've got a lot of a good inventory you can deal with. You have renters, you don't have too much government interference. If all those things work well for you. Then, uh, you know, it's better to buy close to where you live, I think. And Warren preached that too. He said, you know, you, a lot of people, he quoted a story called acres of diamonds and story about somebody who went far, far away to make money and right. he hit all diamonds right in his backyard so i, I really believe that uh, I'm, I'm a fisherman and i watch guys drive you know 300 miles to go fishing i said why don't you just fish off your dock <laughs> you know, <laughs> there, there's fish right there off your dock there's other guys that come to your dock and fish <laughs> and the same thing true in real estate you know I, I don't have to walk with three or four blocks and i can find a deal so so why why would i go to, to a, a whole other state it doesn't make any sense to me the current interest rates um did you ever think we'd see them? And has it changed your philosophy when you teach people about owning things free and clear? Well, I don't think I ever anticipated 2% long-term mortgages. No. So, you know, I, I, I was surprised when they got this low. Um, as far as owning things free and clear, there, there's two sides of this. You know, if, I don't care if your interest rate is zero. If you owe somebody some money and don't pay them, they can take your property away from you. <laughs> so so you, have to, you have to, at some point, think, okay, how do I, if I have some assets, how do I take some money off the table? You know, how do, how do I pull some off that'll be safe, that, that I can't lose? Even if I do something stupid, we're, we're going to leave this money alone. You know, money you're not going to gamble with. So I still think there's an argument for, for owning properties free and clear, but not all of them. Uh, you know, it, it leverage is a good thing if you think we're going to have inflation. And, uh, I, you know, who knows, but it seems to me like we should have some inflation with all the money the government's spending and, and just the way our uh, government is set up. You know, we, we want to try to push off the cost of things to, to future generations. So if, if you think there's going to be inflation, leverage is a good thing. Uh, but the best way, if you know, if I wanted to have a million dollars in leverage today, I wouldn't go to the bank and borrow a million dollars. i go find somebody who has something for sale for a million bucks and give them a dollar down and, and owe them a million bucks. You know, that, that's a better way to be in debt. Because now if I can't pay them back, I'm giving the property back. If I borrow the million from the bank and can't pay them back, they're coming after me. So <laughs> you have to be careful how you borrow the money, how you get in debt. To me, that's what's so valuable about what you guys teach. I see I've paid cash for everything, you know, at a discount. You know, so I came from a different philosophy and and probably that's because I was I kind of got introduced to the business working for a guy that flipped. So that was kind of my indoctrination, my first taste of real estate was buying something at a discount, negotiating that and then flipping it and making money. And it was always dealt with normal financing or it was dealt with cash. And then, you know, when I hear you guys talk, I feel like uh, the rookie in the room, man, you're, you know, you have to explain things to me three times before I go, okay, I kind of get what you just said. I think everybody's like that. I know I'm like that. I, I had a, a fellow I taught with for years. His name was Jack Miller, and, and Jack was a genius, but he was hard to follow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> It was hard to keep up with what he was talking about. So I taught with him literally for seven years, but it was fun. We, we both had a pretty good sense of humor. We played off of each other and, and had a good time, but I also was trying to figure out what he was talking about. <laughs> you know? yeah. and many times it took me years to say, okay, that's what he's talking about. You know, So you have to hear it more than once, I think, to get it. And uh, no matter no matter who you are, very few people get it the first time. I took a class from him one time only, and it was as for a very specific transaction that I wanted to do. It was 50 lots I wanted to buy and I knew I couldn't buy them. So I was trying to think, and he taught an option class. So when I got mm -hmm. the option book, I was sitting down and he never followed the book one page. He just ad-libbed the whole time. <laughs> and I was thinking, wow, <laughs> that's pretty tough to do. <laughs> I did buy those lots, by the way, which was pretty funny. 
you had a bunch of employees as a as a broker. Did you ever do that as a property buyer, or have you always kept your model simple? Well, I had a, a bunch of salesmen as a broker. I had a couple of employees, but you know, most of them are just uh, commission salesmen. But when I had a, a, a larger operation of investment property, I had I had there was five of us working, five employees. Uh, you know, I had a full-time bookkeeper, I had a full-time uh, receptionist, I had a full-time handyman, and I had uh, my wife and myself, uh, so that all of us were in the business, but we had a lot more properties then. I'm down to, a, I'm not going to give you the exact number, but I'm down to a lot fewer properties now, and most of them are paid for, and I manage everything myself. So Valerie, my wife, and I do work together. She she handles the uh, putting the money in the bank and paying the bills part. I'm, I'm not, not fond of that. And I, I, I am in charge of making the money, you know, bringing the money in the door and getting it in the bank. Uh, so it, it's a good, good team effort. And, you know, I encourage people to get their spouses involved because you never know what's going to happen to you. You know, you, you can, you can get stupid in one day, you know, you can you'd be riding your bike down the street and hit a pothole and <laughs> not remember who you are for a while. So it's, it's real important to have some backup, uh, if you're in this business. And even though the tenants might pay the rent, somebody probably has to pay the taxes and the insurance and put that rent in the bank or it's going to disappear. Absolutely. You know, things are going pretty smoothly in the beginning of 2020 and uh, interest rates were pretty favorable, under 4% unemployment, and all of a sudden the world changed. So like your seminar in October 10th and 11th, change happens. It, it happened. So we wrote that seminar in January. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote a newsletter in January that says change is, is going to come. And that, that was before I even knew about COVID. I, I just felt that we had this 12 year run. I've been watching builders make some extraordinary profits, you know, selling you out, out where you bought that house. You know, none of those houses were there five years ago. They built that whole area in the last five years. They've wow. done a great job. Uh, but we've, we've had this real run going in the real estate world for, for a long time now. And, uh, there's, there's always cycles and, and, you know, it, it may go on for another five years. It's hard to tell. California has some really long runs. Uh, Australia has just finished a 20 year run. Uh, so, you know, it, it could, it could keep going, but there, there's also reasons that, uh, as prices get higher and if interest rates creep up a little bit, that it might slow down and, uh, there may be more opportunity to buy. Yeah, that's, uh, What's been interesting in California, and, I, and you're, you're going to be a lot more familiar with Florida than I am, but California median price has gone up past 700 grand, and they're really getting aggressive price gains in the last three months. And I got to be honest, it surprises me because I, I still see a lot of uncertainty with unemployment. Um, I just... I don't, I don't understand, but the same sort of, is the same sort of thing happening in Florida in the last say three to four months where prices have been pretty aggressive rather than people being fearful of buying. It seems like they're very aggressively buying and the inventory is not very big. So do you have, what, what's your take on that? Why is that occurring? I'm not sure why, but I, I agree with you. I think it is occurring. I, I see people paying extraordinary prices for properties that, you know, I, I look at something and say it's worth a million and a half and somebody pays two and a half million for it. And uh, uh, so they're, they're paying premiums. They're bidding against each other and paying premiums for property. And, uh, and at some point that'll end. You know, if the stock market would fall off the cliff, you know, if it, if it drops uh, 30% tomorrow, it's, it's a psychological thing. Uh, you know, some of people's money's disappears probably on the retirement plan, that type of stuff. But psychologically that, that would, that would really put some fear into people. And when people are afraid, then they start hoarding their cash and they stop buying things. And we had a period of time here in the spring, you know, when, the, when the virus first uh, started to, to affect a lot of people where, where people just sat on their hands, you know, nothing happened there for a month or two, but that, that built up some uh, demand and, and, uh, uh, I think uh, part of what we're seeing in Florida and maybe in parts of California is people moving around. You know, people are coming here from uh, other places. They're, they're getting away from some of the bigger cities and they're looking for a safer place to live, the place they think is safer. Uh, so maybe, maybe, maybe it's uh, folks moving around, moving to places that are they're good places to live that, that's driving this in some ways. And, and maybe that'll continue. We'll see. But I just think, you know, it's just, it's just interesting because I thought the mood would be really tentative and it, it's not, it's very aggressive. And I, yep. I understand the pulling of inventory off. So as soon as the coronavirus hit and the more, you know, okay, go stay at home. 
a lot of houses were pulled off of being for sale. And that made sense. So I think people were saying, okay, well, we're going to get hammered if we keep our home for sale. But it, it now that it's kind of reversed and you have more normal volume, I don't think those people put their homes back on the market in the same amount they took them off. And so all of a sudden you have more demand than inventory. So we are we are seeing overbids. And I in Florida, we're building homes, you know, new homes and selling them. And they sell the first day, 100% of the time right now, which is, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's almost scary and so good, you know. And, that's and, right. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> so right. You and I have both seen a few recessions. So, you know, you know something is going to change at some point. You just don't know when. So that, that's, that's kind of the basis of us teaching this seminar on, on change is, you know, it's sort of, sort of like the old Boy Scout model, be prepared. And that doesn't mean burying your head in the sand when things change. It means anticipating change and figure out what's best for you during these changing markets. You know, what should you do personally? Uh, so we make it a very personal, you know, seminar, it, it, giving them a lot of worksheets and talking about what should you do next? What should you do today with your debt, with your tenants, with your properties, uh, with your partnerships, all that stuff. So get into some detail. Yeah. I, I love the, the, the choices that you present, you know, cash flow today or profit tomorrow. It's obviously that's something that I had to really struggle with. Uh, Jack Fullerton was actually very in, uh, influential in me ever keeping a rental because I didn't, mm-hmm. I did not for a long time. And he was, yeah, yeah, he, <laughs> yeah and, and he became a friend, you know, and he said, what happens, you know, what happens if you can't go flip the next house? What happens to your family? You know, and I, I took it seriously one day. I said, okay. And then, you know, Mike Cantu was, he was at the time, you know, trying to race to the 10 houses free and clear thing. And I'm competitive. Yep. And I said, okay, I, I, I'll take that on. <laughs> yep. Yep. So it's kind of fun, but yeah, you've got a lot of great topics. I'm looking forward to it. I've got a question about, uh, just, it's interesting when you, when you live in California, you come here, I'll be happy not to pay state tax. That'll be, that'll be nice. California state tax is like 13%. Florida is zero. Right. Florida is ranked number fourth, most fiscally sound state in the country. California is something like 45th. So my question is a really honest one. What pays the bills in Florida? Well, we balance the budget every year. Uh, you know, we, we raise uh, taxes, uh, sales taxes, the short answer to your question, but you know, the, uh, and they're, they're going to have some challenges this year because I think sales tax revenue will be down just because you know, there was less volume in the hotel business and, and uh, all the tourist businesses, and all the restaurants. Uh, so that there'll be a challenge balancing the budget this year and they'll have to, to cut some programs. But, you know, Florida always has a balanced budget. I think every state's required to balance their budget. They just do it different ways. Yeah. Well, um, well trust me, California, California doesn't balance a budget. You know, the other thing that confounds people coming from California is your building lot cost. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just astonishing to me. And the story behind all these finished building lots, what did they do? Why did they create so many tens of thousands of finished building lots in advance. That's astonishing. Well, the, 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 there are a couple, uh, you talk about flippers, big time flippers, and they were land flippers. And they would come down and they buy sections of land. And, and when they did that, they buy it out in the woods where, where it was really cheap. And then they would market it out of state and they would market it to people for the relatively low down payment and then monthly payments. So they were taking cash and creating paper with it. Uh, but the markup was phenomenal. It's sort of like the used car business where they buy a car for 300 bucks and sell it for $3,000, $100 down, you know, that kind of deal. Right. So they were, they were probably, I don't know what they, they just hypothetically said they had $100 in a lot and they'd sell it for $3,000 with $200 down and carry back a note. So they didn't have their profit up front. And they did that over and over again with a whole bunch of the state. <laughs> I mean, there are millions of acres that have been developed that way. Uh, and interestingly enough, now I mean, the, the towns have grown out and, and they're starting to build on some of these lots. That's right. And they're still pretty. You can still buy some of those lots in for back taxes for $500 or $1,000. And the retail prices, they got up as high as about $15,000. Then they're back down to about $5,000. And they bounce around a little bit. But as you get into town, you know, where you live and where I live, the, the lot prices have steadily climbed. And, and to buy a, a decent building lot any place close to where any of my rental properties are is 150000 now and, and, and climbing. 
and, and that's, you know, I watched California. I've been teaching in California since the mid-70s. So I watched all the stuff in Garden Grove and Orange County and San Diego. And I watched those prices go from 30000 to 50000 to 100000 to 200000 to 400000 to 800000 I said, that's happening here, too. As people move here, prices of, of land is going to go up because the good land is, is, is what really goes up in value. It's not the house so much. It's the good land. You know, you buy a lot in Garden Grove now, you pay four hundred five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 at the house is a teardown probably more than that. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting about the way Florida gains population versus California, California gains population now a hundred percent from just what's called natural causes, the birth over death. It loses migration now, uh, more than immigration by quite a bit. Florida has just the opposite the death rate and birth rate are almost on par, but you're mm-hmm. the number one state in population percentage gain, and it's all in migration of adults, either immigration or from within the other 49 states. Florida's the mm-hmm. number one attraction. And as far as who's moving there, wealth moves there by, by large margin. Florida's number one for wealth transfer. So that's, that's a, to me, that's an important thing. You know, I pay attention to statistics and I, that put a smile on my face thinking, okay, that's a good business plan to have a lot of seniors that need medical care going forward. And a lot of people with money are landing in Florida. To me, that, that makes a lot of sense. We call that clean industry. Rich old people are clean industry. You know, they come <laughs> down and they spend a lot of money. Don't go to school. Don't break into people's houses. So we don't need as many policemen. We don't need as many schools. It works out pretty well. It does. The coronavirus impact, do you think it's short-lived or a long-term game changer? I think there'll, there'll be a point in time, and I don't know if it's a year from now or two or three years from now, where it's just ancient history. We don't even talk about it anymore. If you think about how it's changed your personal life and then think about how it's changed society, personally, you're washing your hands more. You're staying away from people. You probably haven't had a cold in six months. I haven't. Right. Um, you know, I've got three little kids at the house, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> the chances of me getting a cold are pretty good. We're just being healthier. We have, we've, we've improved our staying healthy uh, routine. And, and as society, we're doing that now too. In society, we're, you know, we're working from home. We're not going out as much. I think those things, a lot of those things are going to stick. Uh, you know, I think people will continue to work from home. I think they, like I learned when I started teaching seminars, uh, Jack and I would go out and teach half a dozen times a year. But when I came back, I found that I would catch up at it. You know, just a few hours, I was all caught up again. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how efficient you become when when you you know when you when you do do things like that. So I think people found they're very efficient working from home and, and they can be, and it's going to change the world probably for a better. And plus, you know, we, we've going to have lots of masks, lots of respirators. We're going to have all sorts of people working on, on developing more medicines. The government is really uh, spot underwriting the cost of development now, which is a big thing. Uh, so I think the world will be a better place in a year. And, and I'm, I'm guessing probably a year from now, things will be kind of back to normal. We'll be doing seminars with without wearing masks, but we'll see. We're wearing masks in this one. You know, uh, the presenters, we're going to be up on the stage and, and at least 30 feet from everybody, so we won't have a mask on, but we want everybody in the room to have a mask on because we want everybody to stay healthy. Wow, okay. I didn't know that that was coming. Okay. Now, bring your mask. <laughs> the, the live seminar, is that the first one this year? It's the first one this year, and okay. I have nothing scheduled for next year. I, I uh, typically teach January in Sarasota, but I'm not going to do that this year until until it calms down a little bit more. Okay. Um, you know, I, I love to teach, but I'm not going to put my family at risk by getting in a big crowd and being the guy who gets unlucky. Last question, and I want to ask you if you have any if you have any new books you're going to write. But are you concerned about any glut of foreclosures coming that would would affect things? I'm a little concerned about the tenants who have deferred their rent because I just can't imagine that any of those tenants who have deferred their rent have saved up enough to pay the rent. Correct. So when the time runs out here, whenever that's going to be, uh, they may delay it again. But when the time runs out, there's going to be a whole bunch of folks who are renters. And I'm not too worried about my people because my people if have stayed current. They paid the rent on time. They like their houses or below the market to start with. So for them to go someplace else would, would not be a, a smart thing. Uh, but for 
you know, there's a whole bunch of tenants who are not very smart and they pay, you know, they live week to week, month to month. And, and I guarantee you, they don't have six months rent saved up, but that's what they have to, to pay to stay in there. So either the landlord's going to uh, end up really short or the government's going to write them some big checks. Something's going to happen. But I, I'm more concerned about that issue than I am uh, foreclosures at this point. The, you know, the, the credit market is a little bit looser than it was maybe two years ago, but it's nothing like it was in you know, 2005, 2006 for where anybody could get a loan. That, that, that's not the market we have. So most people borrowing money today could probably afford to pay it back. And of course, the banks got conservative earlier this year. They're, they're starting to loosen up a little bit now. I have had one tenant move out and buy a house. And then that's kind of a sign to me. If I have a bunch of tenants buy houses, that's a sign that credit is getting pretty loose because most tenants don't have great credit. You know, it's just, just the way it is. So I'm not too concerned about the foreclosures, more concerned about what's going to happen in particular with the big landlords that have uh, big multiple unit buildings, how they're going to handle it. I, I think just like the, you know, there's a lot of hotel foreclosures right now, I think we're going to see a lot of foreclosures in those big apartment buildings. Yeah, I agree with that. Any future books that you're thinking about? Well, just, just to update my biography for you, I, I did rewrite the uh, the Building Wealth One House at a Time in 2016. So that's okay. a newer edition. All and right. It's selling really well. McGraw Hill called me a couple of weeks ago, wants me to update it again and do a third edition. So I'm, I'm going to rewrite that book. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to write a different book right now, but see how things go. Um, uh, book writing is a labor of love. It takes a lot of time. I, I write newsletters, you know, six times a year, I write a, a six page newsletter and that takes me a week just to write that. So that, that, that keeps me pretty busy. I don't have a plan right now to write a new book. James. All right. I got to sign up for that newsletter. So is that on your website? Sure. It's on the website. Okay been writing that since 1978 six times a year six pages that's a lot of pages that's a lot of pages yes it is <laughs> all right well i'll look forward to that i'm still a, a rookie in florida so and you know what's so funny i attended a seminar you guys taught two years ago maybe you and i had some alone time but i, I don't remember it was said in in the at seminar or just maybe during a lunch or something but you made a comment that just being really careful about having business partners yeah. And uh, when I when I had that stuff go on this year, and I, I didn't have a business partner, but I, I became responsible for somebody else's actions willingly. But still, that thought really crossed my mind, what you said. <laughs> I thought that was about a million dollars of advice I should have taken. <laughs> well, you know, that's one reason I write the books and teach a little bit is because I want my kids to, uh, to, to hear some of that, too. But I, I think one of the most important decisions you ever make is who, who you partner up with, both, both in, you know, personally and, and in business, because if you get the wrong partner, either place, it, it's a, uh, it's a nightmare. It is it's just a nightmare. Well, John, thanks so much for joining us and taking time. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in October. I look forward to it too, Bruce. Thanks. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.